please welcome Chief Technology Officer and Executive Vice President of AI, Kevin Scott. So that was an amazing video and thank you Satya for sharing it. It really is inspiring to see this technology getting diffused so quickly and having a real positive impact uh, across the globe, not just in the uh, global, uh, the urban innovation centers here in the United States and in uh, the, the capitals of the industrialized world. Um, so I'm so excited and happy to be with you all here today in person at Build after a four year hiatus. And um, I, I guess it goes without saying that a lot has changed in the world of technology over these past four years. Uh, one of the biggest changes, and it's the theme of this conference, is what has happened in the world of AI uh, just even in the past year and what that means for you all as developers. Um, I, I wrote my first program uh, as a developer in the early 80s when I was uh, 11 years old, I think. Um, and I remember what a thrilling moment that was, like being able to do something for the first time that I didn't even realize was possible. And I've been chasing that feeling my entire career, like trying to find those moments where something impossible became possible, and then as a developer, figuring out how I could participate in that change. And the thing that I can say that is like the most exciting thing in the world to me, maybe the most exciting time that I've experienced in my career, is what that power of AI is doing right now to help all of us have that moment, that ability to take something in our hands, to look at what was possible, what was impossible and becoming possible now, and then going and doing something great with it. Um, so I'm gonna spend uh, my next half an hour or so chatting with you all about some of those technological themes that are driving all of this great progress in AI that we're seeing. So we're gonna start with, uh, you know, maybe the obvious thing. So um, there's an incredible amount of attention being paid right now to what's happening with the rapid progress with these uh, AI models, these foundation models that we're calling them now, and in particular, like the rapid pace of innovation that's being driven by OpenAI in, in their partnership with Microsoft. Um, we really are setting the pace of innovation in the field of AI right now, uh, and, and I think even for us, uh, it's been surprising to see how much of the zeitgeist is being captured by uh, things like ChatGPT and applications that people are building on top of these large foundation models. The reason that this partnership between OpenAI and Microsoft has been so successful is that we really do have an end-to-end -end platform for building AI applications. We built the world's most powerful supercomputers. We have the world's most capable foundation models, uh, either hosted that we built ourselves and make available to you all via API, or open source, uh, which run great on Azure. Uh, we also have the world's best AI developer infrastructure. So whether that is using these super powerful computers to train your models from scratch, or to build these applications that we're gonna be talking about at Build this year on top of that infrastructure, like we have that end-to-end -end platform. And you're gonna hear a ton about it today and tomorrow. Scott's keynote is right after mine, uh, like he's gonna dive into detail on a bunch of this stuff and then the breakout sessions are gonna be amazing and like equip you all with the information that you need to go do some pretty awesome stuff. So, you know, this end-to-end -end platform starts with Azure. Um, I, I, we really believe that Azure is the cloud for AI. Um, and it's not just the uh, amazing, technically complicated and brilliant work that our partners OpenAI have done on top of all of this infrastructure, uh, but it's things that the teams at Microsoft are doing to build uh, our co-pilot applications and our own uh, advanced AI models. And it's also the things that our partners, uh, some of you here in this room are building on top of Azure, uh, making Azure this amazing platform for doing the most ambitious flavors of AI in the world. But it's not just Azure. Um, Windows, we believe is the best client for AI development. And you're gonna see a bunch of that uh, today and Panos is gonna dive into it pretty deeply tomorrow. Um, so Satya showed the Windows Copilot, which is going to be an amazing part of your productivity story, like GitHub Copilot works great on Windows, but increasingly what you're gonna see is the ability to run 
these powerful AI models on your Windows PC uh, so that you can develop these true hybrid AI applications that span the edge all the way to the cloud. Um, and it's just a really, really exciting thing. Um, but what I'm gonna spend most of my talk uh, discussing with you all is this idea of the co-pilot. Uh, Satya has already referenced a whole bunch of the co-pilots we've launched, like you, you know, as he said, uh, you know, it's almost as if uh, we woke up on January the 1st and decided to do a whole bunch of press releases, but it's really been years of work uh, where we have built a platform for building co-pilots that has enabled us to do uh, these amazing releases that we've been doing, uh, and we are sharing with you all today some of those patterns that have helped us build co-pilots and showing you and opening up our platform so that you can build co-pilots of your own. And so just to start with, uh, like a co-pilot simply said, is an application that uses modern AI that has a conversational interface that assists you with cognitive tasks. And we're gonna talk a lot about what that means uh, later. Um, we, we believe that it must be an open ecosystem. Um, so like one of the most important things that we believe is even though like there are a whole bunch of co-pilots that Microsoft has built, that maybe the most interesting co-pilots that get built are by you all uh, using these powerful tools that you have uh, both on Azure, on Windows, and in the open source community. So, you know, as we uh, start talking about this, I would love to bring to stage uh, Greg Brockman, uh, the president and co-founder of OpenAI, to talk about his experiences building GPT-4, like this powerful model that's powering a bunch of these co-pilots, and about ChatGPT, which maybe is the most interesting co-pilot in the world right now. So please join me on stage, Greg. Good to see you. Awesome. Fantastic, so thank you so much for joining us today here at Build. Um, so I wanted to start with the chat GPT experience. So uh, like I, I believe it's caught us all by surprise like just how uh, crazy the adoption of chat GPT has been and how much interest there is, but like it's a really big engineering challenge to build something like chat GPT. So maybe you could talk a little bit with us about that. Yeah, you know, chat GPT was a really interesting process, both from an infrastructure perspective and an ML perspective. Um, we'd actually been working on kind of the idea of having a chat system for a number of years. We'd even demoed at Build uh, an early version called WebGPT. Yep. Uh, and it was cool. It was a fun demo. Uh, we had a couple hundred contractors, literally people we had to pay to use this system. And they were like, eh, it's kind of useful, can kind of help with coding tasks. Um, but for me, the moment that really clicked was when we had GPT-4. Um, and that we had a traditional process, GPT-3, we just deployed the base model, so just been pre-trained, we hadn't really tuned it in any direction, and that was in the API. For 3.5, we'd actually gotten to the point where we were doing instruction following, where we had contractors who were given, here's an instruction, and here's how you're supposed to complete it. And we did that training on GPT-4. And the thing that was so interesting was I just, as a little experiment, was like, well, what happens if you follow up with a second instruction? after it already generated something. And the model replied with a perfectly good response that incorporated everything bef from before then. And so you realize that this model was capable enough, it had really generalized this idea of, well, if you really want me to follow instructions and you give me a new instruction, maybe you really want me to have a conversation. And so for me, that was the moment that it kind of clicked that, okay, we have this infrastructure that's already in place with earlier model and this new model, even just using this sort of technology that wasn't meant for chat, it wants to chat, like it's going to work. Um, and so this was a real aha moment. And from there, we just were like, we got to get this thing out. It's going to work. Yeah, and I think it was really surprising to me. I remember when Sam called me up and said, hey, like, you know, we want to release this chat GPT thing. And like, you know, we think it's going to be a few weeks worth of, uh, you know, work to condition one of these models. And I was like, sure, why not? Uh, I, I had no idea that it was going to work technically as well as it did and that it was going to be such a crazy success. And so, you know, maybe, Related to that, um, I, I know that you are one of the principal architects on all of the infrastructure that was used to train GPT-4. Uh, and so GPT-4 powers uh, parts of ChatGPT and it has uh, just really been a revelation for everyone who's been working in the field of AI. So I wonder if you could share a little bit of, you know, what are some of the interesting things that you found about the development of GPT-4? Yeah, GPT-4 was very much a labor of love. Um, as a company, we'd actually, after GPT-3, had multiple failed attempts 
to surpass the performance of that model. Um, it's not an easy thing. And what we ended up doing was going back to the drawing board, rebuilding our entire infrastructure. And a lot of the approach we took was get every detail right. And I'm sure that there's still bugs. I'm sure that there's still more details to be found. Um, but you know, an analogy from Jakob, who is one of the leads on the project that I really like, is it's almost like building a rocket, where you yep. want all the engineering tolerances to be incredibly tiny. And so lots of little details. Like, for example, it used to be, it turns out that if we had, a, we had a bug in our checkpointing, where if you killed the job at exactly the wrong moment, you could end up with a blend between you know, new weights and old weights uh, when the job restarted. Machine learning mostly doesn't care. It's happy to, to recover from that. But it's one of those things where every time you see a weird wiggle in your graph, you're like, huh, I wonder if this was that particular issue or if it's a real, real other one. And so if you go back and you really pay attention to every single detail and just do the boring engineering work, like that is the main thing that I do. Yeah, well, I mean, the boring engineering you work do is like at a, just an unbelievable phenomenal scale. But like, I do think that that's a good, uh, you know, parable for everyone in the room. It's sometimes the boring engineering work that like really leads to success. Um, so Satya talked a little bit in his talk about this uh, shared approach that we're developing for plugins, this idea that we're going to empower all of these folks in the room to write software that can extend the capability of things like chat GPT and like all of these co-pilots that we're building. Um, and I know that that also has been an interesting uh, technical challenge and like we still don't yet have all of the uh, technical uh, you know, issues sorted out and like there's a lot of work left to do to like get it into the state that we ultimately want it to be in. So I, I wonder if you uh, like have some thoughts you wanted to share on that. I love plugins. Yeah. Like, I think it's been a really amazing opportunity both for sort of every developer to leverage this technology in a way that just makes the system better for everyone, right? And that's what, what I think is so exciting. Part of the reason we designed it as an open standard was because that way, as a developer, you build this thing once and then any AI can use it. And it's such, it's such a, a beautiful idea, right? I think that the web, part of what really drove it was anyone can build a website and now everyone gets access to that. And then you build an API and suddenly anyone can leverage it. And I think that this kind of core design principle of really having any developer who wants be able to plug in, get the power of the system, and be able to bring all of the power of any domain into ChatGPT is really, really amazing. Yeah, and I, the thing that I really love about plugins is conceptually the it's so simple. It reminds me a little bit about the, the first HTTP uh, server that I ever wrote. Like, if you understand the core concepts, you can stand up something very quickly that can do something very powerful. And like, I, I think that is an awesome, uh, awesome thing as an engineer. Um, so, you know, in your role at OpenAI, like you are constantly thinking about how to push the limits of the technology. Uh, and, you know, I think one of the really amazing things about our partnership is working with you all. It feels like we get to see a little bit further into the future than we otherwise would be able to. So I wonder if you could say a few things about what's exciting to you about what's over the horizon, like either with applications or with the models. Yeah, the thing that to me is interesting is we're almost on a bit of a TikTok cycle, like, you know, Intel of yore, uh, where you kind of come up with an innovation and then you really push it. And I think that with GPT-4, we're kind of in the, the, that early stage of really pushing it, right? That we still have vision capabilities that have been announced, but that we're still productionizing. And I think that it'll just kind of change how these, these systems work and how they feel and kind of the kinds of applications that can be built on top of them. So I'm really excited to, if you also look back at kind of the history that over the past couple of years, I think we did like a 70% price reduction two years ago. Um, the basically this past year, we did a 90% cost reduction, like a 10x cost drop. Like, like that's crazy, right? Crazy. And I think we're going to be able to do the same thing repeatedly with, with new models. And so GPD-4 right now, it's expensive. It's, 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 you know, it's not fully available, um, but that's one of the things that I think will change. Yeah, and I, I think that is, you know, a thing that I would want to leave everyone here in the room with is that, you know, and it's what we say to all of the developers inside of Microsoft building on top of these things, like what's expensive today won't be tomorrow uh, because the progress there is so fantastic. So I, I think we've got time to squeeze one last thing in. So um, you've already dispensed a bunch of like really great advice for uh, developers here in the room, but like maybe one more thing that you would uh, leave the audience with. I think that in this field, there's, the technology is clearly getting better and better. Um, but the thing that I think every developer can do that is hard for us, and even, even Microsoft at Microsoft scale to do, 
is to really go into specific domains and figure out how to make this technology work there. So I really love companies that are in the legal domain and really getting expertise and talking to lots of lawyers and understanding what their pain points are with this technology. And so I think that, that there's a huge amount of value to be added by, by the efforts of everyone. I, I think that's awesome. Uh, like, you, you heard it from Greg, you all are the ones who are gonna make AI great. Uh, so thank you so much, Greg, for being with us here today. Thank, uh, you, thank for you for all you. you're doing. Thank you very Absolutely. much. So uh, one more uh, interesting open AI thing that we're gonna do. So we have Andre Karpathy uh, here. I think I see Andre uh, in the front row. Uh, so Andre is gonna be here on this stage uh, later today doing a uh, state of GPT. So he's gonna walk through the technology from beginning to end. Uh, like it's gonna be an awesome session, uh, like probably gonna be tight on seating. So like try to get your spot here. Uh, you are not going to want to miss that. Um, so, Let's talk about co-pilots. Um, so Satya mentioned a bunch of uh, the co-pilots that Microsoft has launched, Chat, uh, you know, and then our partners have launched. So, you know, we sort of think of ChatGPT as fitting this co-pilot pattern. Uh, Bing Chat certainly, GitHub Copilot, the Microsoft Security Copilot, Microsoft 365 Copilot, uh, and Designer, um, many, many more. Um, so the thing that we noticed as we were building these co-pilots, starting with GitHub Copilot several years ago, is that the idea of a co-pilot is actually pretty general. So this notion that you're gonna have a multi-turn conversational agent-like interface on your software that helps you do cognitively, cognitively complex things um, applies to more than just helping someone do software development. Um, and, and that's sort of what you've seen. Like we have search co-pilots now, we're gonna have security co-pilots, we have productivity co-pilots, and we're gonna have all of the co-pilots that you all build. Um, and the thing that we noticed uh, for us at Microsoft is that we needed to look at what is common across all of these things so that we can understand how to design great user experiences and what the technology stack is that is going to empower us to deliver these things safely, responsibly, cost-effectively at scale. So the only reason that we have been able to do this sort of blitz of co-pilot announcements uh, and delivering these products to users so quickly is because we stopped uh, and took the time and energy to go build a co-pilot uh, technology stack that would allow us to move quickly with, uh, with, with safety. Um, so one of the things that I wanna talk with you about today is what that technology stack looks like. Um, but before we dive into the details, like, you know, I think Satya's reminder to us all, like, why do we do what we do? So one of the important reasons that we have taken the time to sort of think about this co-pilot stack as one coherent thing is platforms are important. Um, it gives us the opportunity to build things that are more ambitious than you otherwise would be able to build, and it gives you, the developers, a chance to build things that wouldn't be possible if the platform didn't exist. So I, I love this quote from Bill Gates. Uh, it, it may or may not be apocryphal, uh, but it's, it's still just been uh, attributed to Bill for many, many years. And, you know, what Bill is saying here is that the true value of a platform only materializes when the value created on that platform is uh, accrues to the people who are building on top of the, of the platform, not the platform builder itself. And so, like, if that's not true of a platform, then it's really not a platform. And, you know, the thing that makes platforms even greater than all of that value that they can potentially produce is it prevents folks from having to bear the burden of building very complicated things from the ground up just to build the application that they want to go build. It's great if you want to build all of this stuff if you want to be a platform company or an infrastructure company, but if what you want to do is build a legal co-pilot like Greg was talking about, or you want to make a co-pilot for medicine or a co-pilot for uh, helping people get through their insurance claims, um, you are not going to want to build all of this stuff from the ground up. It will be economically infeasible. Um, the amount of compute that we are investing in and just sort of the scale of all of that infrastructure is absolutely astronomical. Um, and the fact that the things that come out of the other end of the compute, these foundation models in this entire platform, that they are reusable and generalizable is like really a fantastic thing. And like one of the things that we've been betting on for five years now, that this was going to be a durable property of these systems. So 
One of the things that you're going to hear a lot about at Build is uh, this idea that the foundation models are powerful and they're getting more powerful, but they can't do everything. Um, and you shouldn't have to wait around until we train a model that can do the thing that you want to do. You should have ways to accommodate uh, your application, uh, build your application on top of this technology, um, even when the model itself isn't uh, complete or perfect. And so we're going to talk about a ton of ways that you can do that. Uh, Satya has already referenced plugins. Greg and I chatted about plugins. Like plugins are going to be one of those powerful mechanisms that you use to augment a copilot or an AI application so that it can do more than what uh, the base platform allows you to do. Um, and, and like what a plugin may do is it helps augment your AI system so that it can access APIs and via API can do anything like. Uh, change state in a digital system or retrieve information. Uh, like for sure people will use um, plugins to retrieve useful information. Like you've already seen some uh, video demos of that happening already and you're going to hear a lot more about that. Um, it allows you to perform arbitrary computations uh, and to safely act on the user's behalf. And you know, really the way that we think about these plugins is they're almost like uh, actuators of the digital world. So anything that you can imagine doing digitally, like you can connect a copilot to those things via plugins. Um, but what, what I'm gonna spend the rest of this talk uh, focusing on is the anatomy of a copilot. So what does a copilot look like? What is shared? Uh, what's common among all of these things that we built? And like, what are the platform components that we are building to help you all build copilots of your own? Um, so this starts from the user experience. Uh, there are some things that are the same, and there are some things that are different about building copilot user experiences. Uh, there is an application architecture, and there will be some familiar things about it, but like a bunch of new stuff to learn. And then it is, uh, it, it is, so important for all of us to think about safety and security. You'll inherit a lot of that by using the tools that we built for you all, but like, you know, it's a thing that you need to think about from the very first steps of building your copilot applications. So I just want to start with the thing that doesn't change when you're thinking about building a copilot. You have to build a great product. So it, it's, it, it is something that we sometimes forget, but you have to understand what that unmet user need is, uh, like what it is that you are trying to make better, where you have a unique understanding of that thing that maybe no one else has, and then you need to apply the technology. Like sure, the tech is great, it's making a whole bunch of things that were impossible or infeasible or expensive, uh, possible, easier, and cheaper. Um, but it does not absolve any of us of the responsibility of sort of thinking about what good product making looks like. And one thing in particular that you have to really bear in mind is the model is not your product. Unless you are an infrastructure company, uh, like the model itself is just infrastructure that is enabling your product. Like it isn't the thing in and of itself. And so like one of the mistakes that I've seen just you know, being in, in the tech industry over 20 years is like having people sort of fixate on uh, infrastructure versus fixating on product. So you know, it's just the thing that you know, we even have to remind our teams here inside of Microsoft over and over and over again is like use the infrastructure that you have at hand that is best going to enable you to solve your problem. Don't build infrastructure that you don't have to build. Um, and, and again, it, it's just up to you all, it's up to us, like we have to build great experiences, things that delight users, like we got to get things out into the hands of users as quickly as possible, see what works, see what doesn't work, iterate, make them better. So let's dive into the Copilot stack. So Satya already showed this, uh, and like we're going to blow it up a little bit now. Um, so this is uh, how our co-pilots at Microsoft are structured, and like these are some of the things that we're going to be diving into greater detail in subsequent talks for you all to have a look at, to pick up, to use, to learn about, and to make things. Um, some of this may look familiar. Uh, so there are three boxes. Uh, you can think of these as roughly corresponding to the three tiers of a normal application. So you've got a front end, you've got a mid tier, you've got a back end. So the front end, like the things that we've already talked about, is like you start with understanding what your amazing product idea is. 
The, the thing that's a little bit different about the user experience design with co-pilots is uh, we have more or less been building user experiences the same way for 180 plus years since Ada Lovelace wrote the first program. Like we have had to understand what the machine is capable of and then we are fiddling around with how we express the connection between the human and the machine like in very explicit ways. So like what that means for you all is like fiddling around with user interface elements, menus, binding code to actions, uh, like trying to fully anticipate the needs of the user and architecting your applications in a particular and familiar way so that people know how to get at all the functionality, the capability that you really built into your code. The thing that's a little bit different in a co-pilot is you're gonna spend less time thinking about like what your user interface widgets are um, and like trying to second guess the user about what it is they want because they have this really natural mechanism to express what it is they want, natural language. And so like what you have to think about in the design of these co-pilots is like what it is you want the co-pilot to actually be capable of. So like what are the things a model can't do that you need to augment with like a bunch of the stuff that I'm about to show you in the orchestration layer with plugins uh, and you know, maybe even with fine tuning models or using a portfolio of models to accomplish. But it's gonna be way less of that fiddling around like mapping user interface elements to little chunks of code than, uh, than you're accustomed to. Um, and you also, on the flip side of that, have to think about uh, what you want the co-pilot not to do. Um, and so this is like important in how you're thinking about safety, but also because like the thing at the bottom of the stack, these foundation models are sort of uh, uh, like a big bucket of unrestrained capability. Like you're the one who oftentimes has to restrain it to like your particular domain. Um, for, for instance, with GitHub Copilot, like, a bunch of the work that we did is to like keep the model uh, on task, which is help, helping you solve your development problems. Like you're not trying to figure out what the best menu item is on Taco Bell when you're uh, sitting in uh, GitHub Copilot trying to write a piece of code. Um, so that's the user interface, like just broad brush, like what is different there. So now let's talk about orchestration. Um, so orchestration is like the business logic of your copilot. Um, and, and as I mentioned, when we started building our own co-pilots, every team inside of the company was building their own orchestration layer. So like all of that logic to figure out like how to get a thing to, you know, sequence through all of the models, do all of the filtering, like do all of the prompt uh, augmentation that you have to do to like build a really great app. And we just sort of noticed that there was commonality across all of those things. So one of the things that we did that greatly affected our ability to get these co-pilots out to market at scale and to do more ambitious things was to decide that inside of Microsoft, we are going to have one orchestration mechanism that we will use to help build our apps. Uh, that is called Semantic Kernel, which we've open sourced, uh, and there's a session on Semantic Kernel later at Build, which I would encourage you all to attend. But like we also uh, know that we're not the only ones who've seen that there's all of this commonality across orchestration. And there's some really great open source orchestration tools that work super well inside of the Azure ecosystem that we're building. So Harrison from Langchain, uh, shout out to Harrison, is here with us uh, in the front row. Um, yeah, give Harrison a round of applause, please. So Lang Langchain is like one of the most uh, popular open source orchestration mechanisms uh, and uh, like, you know, Harrison with a very small team has uh, you know, built a thing that is useful to an extraordinary number of developers. Um, so, you know, and, and orchestration isn't a solved problem. Uh, like we're gonna see a lot of new ideas there uh, and like the thing that I want to assure everyone here in the room is that um, you'll be able to use whatever orchestration mechanism you want. Uh, like we'll give you some options uh, that we think are great for us. Uh, like we'll point you to some of our open source favorites, uh, but if you wanna roll your own thing, like that's your choice. Uh, like I'm a developer, I like rolling my own stuff uh, sometimes too. Um, one of the things that you'll see in Scott Guthrie's talk uh, that's coming up next is PromptFlow, uh, which is another orchestration mechanism that actually unifies uh, Langchain and Semantic Kernel. Uh, and so like I encourage you all to go dive a little bit deeper there. So inside of the orchestration layer, the, uh, the fundamental thing that you're gonna be manipulating is a prompt. And so a prompt is just a bucket of tokens uh, that 
is generated by the user experience layer of your application. It could be, you know, in something like Bing Chat or ChatGPT, like a question or uh, like a, a thing that a user is asking the model to do. Or it could be something that your application constructs, uh, like where it's not a direct natural language thing from the user, but a natural language thing that you are conveying to the model from your application. And a big part of handling those prompts at the beginning stages of orchestration is um, prompt and re response filtering. Uh, so basically saying, I'm not going to allow these prompts through uh, because you know, maybe they will cause the model to respond in a way that doesn't meet the needs of your application or do something unsafe. I um, mean, you also filter responses on the way back up. Um, so after the model has produced a response to the prompt, uh, like you may decide that you want to filter some or all of the prompt out. Uh, like a natural thing to, uh, where, where this happens is with the safety infrastructure that you're going to see uh, Sarah Bird talk about in her talk later. Uh, but like there are other reasons that you may want to do some filtering on the responses. You also have this uh, unit of, of uh, prompt code called the meta prompt. And the meta prompt is the standing set of instructions that you give to your co-pilot uh, that get passed down to the model on every turn of conversation that tells it how to accommodate itself to the co-pilot that you're trying to build. Uh, it's where a bunch of your safety tuning is going to happen. Uh, it's where you sort of tell the model like what personality you want it to have. Uh, so like for instance, we use the meta prompt to do things like telling Bing Chat to be more balanced uh, versus more precise. Um, it is also like how you sort of teach the model new capabilities. So like you can even think of Metaprompt design as a form of fine tuning. Um, and so it's just far easier to do things in the Metaprompt than to like have to go down to the lower layers of the infrastructure and start rolling your own things. Um, once you get past the meta prompt and the prompt filtering stages, like you start to think about grounding. And grounding is all about adding additional context to the prompt that may be useful for helping the model respond to the prompt that's flowing down. So in the case of Bing Chat, which uh, I think is the first place that was really doing retrieval augmented generation before retrieval augmented generation had a name, um, we basically look at the at the prompt, the user query, and issue an, a query to the search index to find relevant documents for the prompt. We add those documents to the prompt and send it to the model so that it has that extra context to provide a good answer. Um, increasingly, people are using vector databases uh, to do retrieval augmented generation. So like you may take the prompt, compute a set of embeddings for them, and then do a lookup in a vector database that is indexed by those embeddings uh, to get relevant documents for the prompt and give that extra context for the model to give you a better answer. But you may also uh, augment the prompt and do grounding with arbitrary web APIs, and like you can even think about using plugins for doing grounding. Um, you know, the, and so the next step here is like this is where plugin execution happens. Uh, so at this stage, like again, you know, what I just mentioned in grounding, like you may use uh, the plugin to add some extra context to the prompt before it goes down to the model, or you may execute something, uh, you know, do do a plugin execution on the way back up from the model so that you can take an action on a system. So once you get through uh, like all of the stuff in the orchestration layer, and I should say like also, um, you, you may be doing multiple turns through this whole system. So like calling multiple models, like making multiple passes through this whole pipeline in order to like get what you need from the system. Um, but at the very bottom of the stack are uh, foundation models and infrastructure. And we give you a bunch of choices for how to use foundation models uh, in this Copilot platform on Azure and on Windows. So you can choose to use one of the hosted foundation models like the ChatGPT model or the GPT-4 model that are now available on the Azure OpenAI API service. Um, you can fine tune one of these hosted foundation models, uh, the ChatGPT-3.5, fine-tuning APIs are live now, and you'll be able to fine-tune GPT-4 soon. Um, but if neither of those options work for you, like you have sort of exhausted all of the things that you can do in the orchestration layer to get your uh, co-pilot to do what you need, uh, and neither of these things will work for you, like you can't wholly solve your problem with a hosted API because of whatever reason, uh, you can't use the fine-tuning APIs to accomplish what you want to accomplish, you can bring your own model. And like we are 
incredibly excited about what's happening in the open source community right now. Like there's a bunch of brilliant, brilliant work happening with open source models. Uh, and one of the things that you will see in the next talk is we have the Azure AI catalog, uh, model catalog, that is going to be a place you can go inside of Azure to find the most popular models on Hugging Face and in GitHub, where you'll be able to push button, provision, and deploy those models to Azure to use in your co-pilots. Um, and also, like, you can train your own model from scratch. Like, as we mentioned several times, like, from the, the most ambitious models in the world, the ones that OpenAI are training, uh, all the way down to, like, smaller things, like Azure AI supercomputing infrastructure and our environment give you a great, great way to train your model from scratch if that's what you need to do. So this is, this is the co-pilot stack, top to bottom. Uh, and what I want to do now is make this maybe a little bit less abstract by talking about uh, a co-pilot that I wrote. Um, so I host a podcast called Behind the Tech. And every month uh, when the podcast airs, my team comes and bugs me to write a social media post to advertise the podcast. And I suck at this. Uh, like I forget to read my emails, like they have to bug me over and over again, and like they really, really want a Kevin social media co-pilot so they don't have to go through the irritation of dealing with me. And so, you know, I had the honor recently of uh, interviewing Neil deGrasse Tyson on the podcast, and so like I'm just gonna walk you through uh, this co-pilot that we built, uh, that we actually just ran, uh, and it did the social media post for the Neil deGrasse Tyson podcast that just went live. So here's what it looks like. Um, so just end-to-end -end picture, like the co-pilot runs on a Windows PC. It uses a mixture of open source models and hosted models. Uh, it uh, like does retrieval augmented generation, um, and it calls a plugin to finish doing its work. So let's walk through these step by step. So the first step of this process is we have an audio file and we need a transcript. So on our Windows PC, we take the OpenAI open source whisper model and run the audio through the model to get a transcript. Um, does a really amazing job. So once we have the transcript, like the next stage in the orchestration, is uh, we have the Databricks Dolly 2.0 12 billion parameter large language model running on our Windows PC, and we ask it some things about the transcript. Like for instance, who was the guest this episode? Like, because again, we want to do this like lights out, like not have to have Kevin answering a bunch of questions because he's uh, slow and annoying. Um, so the next thing we do once we have the transcript and we have all of this information that we've extracted from uh, from the transcript, uh, like we want to send a chunk of that to the Bing API, uh, or like we want to send Neil's name to the Bing API to get a bio. And then we're gonna combine all of this stuff together into uh, a single packet of information, uh, like a big prompt that has some stuff about the transcript, some, uh, and some stuff about Neil, and we get our social media blurb. Um, like this is a pretty good blurb, uh, so we're gonna go to the next step here, uh, which is like we need a thumbnail. So we call our hosted OpenAI API to get an image from the Dolly model. Uh, this looks pretty good, it's cosmic, it's sort of podcasty, uh, like plenty good enough uh, for this, uh, this post. And so the last step is uh, we want to invoke a plugin uh, for LinkedIn that will take the thumbnail and the post and the link to the podcast and just post it to my LinkedIn feed. Um, one of the super important things about this is we are, um, like, before we take an action on the user's behalf, we want to present to them, like, what it is that's going to happen. Because if, if for some reason or another, the model went haywire and produced something that we didn't want to post, like, once I hit yes, this is going to 800,000 people on LinkedIn. So we review, we click yes, and we post. So, uh, and this is the live post that's uh, like on LinkedIn right now. You should go check out uh, this episode with Neil. It's awesome. So this is a really just a, a, a uh, illustration for you all. Like I'm not claiming that this is the most interesting co-pilot in the world, but it was really pretty easy to, uh, pretty easy to, um, uh, to, to do. Um, 
So we posted all of the code on the GitHub repo. Like I encourage all of you to check it out. Like it's a good template for thinking about how to build your first, uh, first co-pilot. So the thing that we want to talk about uh, last before we, uh, before we jump in um, to Scott's keynote is AI safety. So it's the first thing that we think about when we're building co-pilots. Um, and we think about it at every step of the process. Um, you're going to hear a ton about this great AI safety work from my colleague Sarah Boyd, who runs our uh, responsible AI infrastructure team inside of the AI platform group. Um, it's really, really super good stuff. Uh, like we're giving you all some amazing tools to go uh, build uh, really safe, responsible AI applications. Um, just very quickly, like I want to mention uh, one of the things that you're hearing here for us, Satya mentioned it, is we're giving you a bunch of like amazing media provenance tools uh, that will help users understand when they're seeing generated content or not. Like we're going to be uh, watermarking all of the content that we are producing and we're giving you tools where if your AI applications, your co-pilots are generating synthetic content, you'll be able to call our APIs and add these cryptographic uh, provenance watermarks to your tools. It's super, super exciting stuff. So, um, co-pilots, um, you have heard from us that we have this amazing new software development pattern. Um, you have heard about how we think about architecting co-pilots. Um, and you have heard our enthusiasm that like, not only are there gonna be a bunch of co-pilots from Microsoft and from our partners, but like, we really think that you all are going to be the ones who build the most interesting co-pilots in the world. Um, it's just like any other major platform, like the thing that makes your PC great, the thing that makes the internet great, the thing that makes uh, a smartphone great, aren't the things that launch uh, when those platforms launch, it's what you all will create on top of them. So um, I want to share one anecdote before we go. Um, I was an intern at Microsoft Research in 2001. I came, uh, came to MSR with my PhD advisor uh, when he went on sabbatical. And we would go out with our research group every Thursday to this uh, burrito joint in Bellevue that I think is closed now called Acapulco Fresh. And occasionally this gentleman would join us. His name is Murray Sargent. And Murray, uh, like I was a 30-year-old PhD student, um, seemed like a legend to me because Murray was the guy who had broken the 64K limit uh, on the Intel microprocessors. So like many of you may be too young to even remember this, but at one point in time, like the computers that we shipped could only use 64 kilobytes of memory uh, for doing the work that they had to do. And Murray was the guy when the 286 came out that figured out protected mode and got Microsoft software to work uh, beyond that 64K uh, memory barrier. And it's like unbelievable to sort of think about what impact like small things like that had on the trajectory of the industry. Um, so, you know, I, I, I was in awe of Murray, and I wondered uh, every time we had lunch with him, what am I ever going to do in my career that would, would allow someone like me, uh, like a younger version of myself, to look at me and think, wow, like this guy did some legendary stuff. And so this is the moment for all of us now. We have capabilities in our hands with these new tools. In the early days of this new platform, to absolutely do amazing things, where literally the challenge for you all is to go do some legendary shit that someone will be in awe of you for one day. And so with that, I would like to bring to stage uh, my colleague, uh, Executive Vice, Vice President of Cloud and AI, uh, the legend himself, Scott Guthrie.